Disc 15, Men at Arms By Terry Pratchett Audiobook 11x18 All That Counting I Dunno I saw it all All what? Just all of it Everything All the numbers in the world I could count them all What did they equal? Dunno What does equal mean? They trudged on, to see what the future held. The trail led eventually into a narrower tunnel, barely wide enough for the troll to stand upright. Finally they could go no further. A stone had dropped out of the roof and rubble and mud had percolated through, blocking the tunnel. But that didn't matter because they'd found what they were looking for, even though they hadn't been looking for it. Oh dear, said Detritus. Very definitely, said Cuddy. He looked around vaguely. You know, he said, I reckon these tunnels are usually full of water. They're well below the normal river level. He looked back to the pathetic discovery. There's going to be a lot of trouble about this, he said. It's his batch, said Carrot. Good grief. He's holding it so tight it's cut right into his hand. Technically Ankh-Morpork is built on loam, but what it is mainly built on is Ankh-Morpork, it has been constructed, burned down, silted up, and rebuilt so many times that its foundations are old cellars, buried roads and the fossil bones and middens of earlier cities. Below these, in the darkness, sat the troll and the dwarf. What we doing now? We ought to leave it here and fetch Corporal Carrot. He'll know what to do. Detritus looked over his shoulder at the thing behind them. I don't like that, he said. It not right to leave it here. Right. Yes, you're right. But you're a troll and I'm a dwarf. What do you think would happen if people saw us carrying that along the streets? Big trouble. Correct. Come on. Let's follow the footprints back out. Supposing it gone when we come back, said Detritus, lumbering to his feet. How? And we're following the tracks out, so if whoever it was who put it there comes back, we'll run straight into them. Oh, good. I glad you said that. Vim sat on the edge of his bed while Angua bandaged his hand. Captain Quirk, said Carrot. But he's not a good choice. Mayonnaise Quirk, we used to call him, said Colin. He's a pillock. Don't tell me, said Angua. He's rich, thick and oily, yes. And smells faintly of eggs, said Carrot. Plumes in his helmet, said Colin, and a breastplate you can see your face in. Well, Carrot's got one of those too said Nobby. Yes, but the difference is, Carrot keeps his armor polished because he likes nice clean armor, said Colin loyally. While Quirk keeps his shiny because he's a pillock. But he's wrapped up the case, said Nobby. I heard about it when I went out for the coffee. He's arrested Coalface the troll. You know, Captain? The privy cleaner. Someone saw him near Rhyme Street just before the dwarf got killed. But he's massive, said Carrot. He couldn't have got through the door. He's got a motive, said Nobby. Yes. Yes. Hammerhawk was a dwarf. That's not a motive. It is for a troll. Anyway, if he didn't do that, he probably did something. There's plenty of evidence against him. Like what? said Angua. He's a troll. That's not evidence. It is to Captain Quirk, said the sergeant. He's bound to have done something, Nobby repeated. In this he was echoing the patrician's view of crime and punishment. If there was crime, there should be punishment. If the specific criminal should be involved in the punishment process then this was a happy accident, but if not then any criminal would do, 
and since everyone was undoubtedly guilty of something, the net result was that, in general terms, justice was done. He's a nasty piece of work, that coalface, said Colin. A right-hand troll for Chrysopraise. Yes, but he couldn't have killed Bjorn, said Carrot. And what about the beggar girl? Vim sat looking at the floor. What do you think, Captain, said Carrot. Vim shrugged. Who cares, he said. Well, you care, said Carrot. You always care. We can't let even someone like listen to me, said Vims, in a small voice. Supposing we'd found who killed the dwarf and the clown. Or the girl. It wouldn't make any difference. It's all rotten anyway. What is, Captain, said Colin. All of it. You might as well try and empty a well with a sieve. Let the assassins try to sort it out. Or the thieves. He can try the rats next. Why not? We're not the people for this. We ought to have just stayed with ringing our bells and shouting all's well. But all isn't well, Captain, said Carrot. So what? When has that ever mattered? Oh, dear, said Angua, under her breath. I think perhaps you gave him too much of that coffee. Vim said, I'm retiring from the watch tomorrow. Twenty-five years on the streets Nobby started to grin nervously and stopped as the sergeant, without apparently shifting position, grabbed one of his arms and twisted it gently but meaningfully up his back. And what good's it all been? What good have I done? I've just worn out a lot of boots. There's no place in Ankh-Morpork for policemen. Who cares what's right or wrong? Assassins and thieves and trolls and dwarfs. Might as well have a bloody king and have done with it. The rest of the night watch stood looking at their feet in mute embarrassment. Then Carrot said, It's better to light a candle than curse the darkness, Captain. That's what they say. What? Vim's sudden rage was like a thunderclap. Who says that? When has that ever been true? It's never been true. It's the kind of thing people without power say to make it all seem less bloody awful, but it's just words, it never makes any difference someone hammered at the door. That'll be quirk, said Vims. You're to hand over your weapons. The night watch is being stood down for a day. Can't have coppers running around upsetting things, can we? Open the door, Carrot. But Carrot began. That was an order. I might not be any good for anything else, but I can bloody well order you to open the door, so open the door. Quirk was accompanied by half a dozen members of the day watch. They had crossbows. In deference to the fact that they were doing a mildly unpleasant job involving fellow officers, they had them pointing slightly downwards. In deference to the fact that they weren't damn fools, they had the safety catches off. Quirk wasn't actually a bad man. He didn't have the imagination. He dealt more in that sort of generalized low-grade unpleasantness which slightly tarnishes the soul of all who come into contact with it. Asterisk many people are in jobs that are a little beyond them, but there are ways of reacting to the situation. Sometimes they're flustered and nice, sometimes they're quirk. Quirk handled them with the maxim. It doesn't matter if you're right or wrong, so long as you're definite. There was, on the whole, no real racial prejudice in Ankh-Morpork, when you've got dwarfs and trolls, the mere color of other, humans is not a major item. But Quirk was the kind of man to whom it comes naturally to pronounce the word Negro with two gs. Asterisk rather like British rail. He had a hat with plumes in it. Come in, come in, said Vims. It wasn't as if we were doing anything. Captain Vims it's all right. We know. Give him your weapons, people. That's an order, Carrot. One official issue sword, one pike, or halberd, 
one nightstick or truncheon, one crossbow. That's right, isn't it, Sergeant Cullen? Yes sir. Carrot hesitated only a moment. Oh, well, he said. My official sword is in the rack. What's that one in your belt? Carrot said nothing. However, he shifted position slightly. His biceps strained against the leather of his jerkin. Official sword. Right, said Quirk. He turned. He was one of those people who would recoil from an assault on strength, but attack weakness without mercy. Where's the grit sucker, he said. And the rock. Ah, said Vims, you are referring to those representative members of our fellow sapient races who have chosen to throw in their lots with the people of this city. I mean the dwarf and the troll, said Quirk. Haven't the faintest idea, said Vims cheerfully. It seemed to Angua that he was drunk again, if people could get drunk on despair. We dunno, sir, said Colin. Haven't seen M all day. Probably fighting up in Quarry Lane with the rest of them, said Quirk. You can't trust people of their type. You ought to know that. And it also seemed to Angua that although words like Halfbent and Gritsucker were offensive, they were as terms of universal brotherhood compared to words like people of their type in the mouth of men like Quirk. Much to her shock, she found her gaze concentrating on the man's jugular vein. Fighting, said Carrot. Why? Quirk shrugged. Who knows? Let me think now, said Vims. It could be something to do with a wrongful arrest. It could be something to do with some of the more restless dwarfs just needing any excuse to have a go at the trolls. What do you think, Quirk? I don't think, Vims. Good man. You're just the type the city needs. Vims stood up. I'll be going, then, he said. I'll see you all tomorrow. If there is one. The door slammed behind him. This hall was huge. It was the size of a city square, with pillars every few yards to support the roof. Tunnels radiated off it in every direction, and at various heights in the walls. Water trickled out of many of them, from small springs and underground streams. That was the problem. The film of running water over the stone floor of the hall had wiped away traces of the footprints. A very large tunnel, almost blocked with debris and silt, led off in what Cuddy was pretty sure was the direction of the estuary. It was almost pleasant. There was no smell, other than a damp, under a stone mustiness. And it was cool. I've seen big dwarf halls in the mountains, said Cuddy but I've got to admit this is something else. His voice echoed back and forth in the chamber. Oh, yes, said Detritus, it's got to be something else, because it's not a dwarf hall in the mountains. Can you see any way up? No, we could have passed a dozen ways to the surface and not known it. Yes, said the troll. It's a naughty problem. Detritus. Yes. Did you know you're getting smarter again, down here in the cool? Really? Can you use it to think of a way out? Digging, the troll suggested. There were fallen blocks here and there in the tunnels. Not many, the place had been well built. Nah. Haven't got a shovel, said Cuddy. Detritus nodded. Give me your breastplate, he said. He leaned it up against the wall. His fist pounded into it a few times. He handed it back. It was, more or less, shovel-shaped. It's a long way up, Cuddy said doubtfully. But we know the way, said Detritus. It's either that, or stay down here eating rat for rest of your life. Cuddy hesitated. The idea had a certain appeal. Without ketchup, Detritus added. I think I saw a fallen stone just away back there, said the dwarf. 
Asterisk Captain Quirk looked around the watchroom with the air of one who was doing the scenery a favor by glancing at it. Nice place, this, he said. I think we'll move in here. Better than the quarters near the palace. But we're here, said Sergeant Colon. You'll just have to squash up, said Captain Quirk. He glanced at Angua. Her stare was getting on his nerves. There'll be a few changes, too, he said. Behind him, the door creaked open. A small, smelly dog limped in. But Lord Veterinary hasn't said who's commanding Night Watch, said Carrot. Ho, oh, yes? Seems to me, seems to me, said Quirk, that it's not likely to be one of you lot, eh? Seems to me it's likely the watches'll be combined. Seems to me there's too much sloppiness around the place. Seems to me there's a bit too much of a ragtag. He glanced at Angua again. The way she was looking at him was putting him off. Seems to me Quirk began again, and then noticed the dog. Look at this, he said. Dogs in the watch house. He kicked Gasbode hard, and grinned as the dog ran yelping under the table. What about Lettuce Nibs, the beggar girl, said Angua. No troll killed her. Or the clown. You got to see the big picture, said Quirk. Mr. Captain, said a low voice from under the table, audible at a conscious level only to Angua, you got an itchy bottom. What big picture's this, then, said Sergeant Colon. Got to think in terms of the whole city said Quirk. He shifted uneasily. Really itchy, said the subtable voice. You feeling all right, Captain Quirk, said Angua. The captain squirmed. Trickle, prickle, prickle, said the voice. I mean, some things are important, some ain't, said Quirk. Arg. Sorry. Trickle. Can't hang around here talking to you all day, said Quirk. You. Report to me. Tomorrow afternoon trickle, prickle, prickle aboot face. The day watch scurried out, with Quirk hopping and squirming in, as it were, the rear. My word, he seemed anxious to get away, said Carrot. Yes, said Angua. Can't think why. They looked at one another. Is that it? said Carrot. No more night watch. It's generally very quiet in the unseen university library. There's perhaps the shuffling of feet as wizards wander between the shelves, the occasional hacking cough to disturb the academic silence, and every once in a while a dying scream as an unwary student fails to treat an old magical book with the caution it deserves. Consider Orang Mutants. In all the worlds graced by their presence, it is suspected that they can talk but choose not to do so in case humans put them to work, possibly in the television industry. In fact they can talk. It's just that they talk in Otang Yutan. Humans are only capable of listening in bewilderment. The librarian of Unseen University had unilaterally decided to aid comprehension by producing AR. Orang Yudin slash Human Dictionary. He'd been working on it for three months. It wasn't easy. He'd got as far as Ook. Asterisk asterisk which can mean. Well. Meanings include. Pardon me, you're hanging from my rubber ring, thank you so very much, it may be just vital biomass oxygenating the planet to you but it's home to me and I'm sure there was a rainforest around here a moment ago. He was down in the stacks, where it was cool. And suddenly someone was singing. He took the pen out of his foot and listened. A human would have decided they couldn't believe their ears. Orangs are more sensible. If you won't believe your own ears, whose ears will you believe? Someone was singing, underground or trying to sing. The thonic voices went something like this. Vlog, glod, vlog, glod listen, 
you. Troll. It's the simplest song there is. Look, like this gold, 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 gold. Gold, 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 no. That's the second verse. There was also the rhythmical sound of dirt being shoveled and rubble being moved. The librarian considered matters for a while. So. A dwarf and a troll. He preferred both species to humans. For one thing, neither of them were great readers. The librarian was, of course, very much in favor of reading in general, but readers in particular got on his nerves. There was something, well, sacrilegious about the way they kept taking books off the shelves and wearing out the words by reading them. He liked people who loved and respected books, and the best way to do that, in the librarian's opinion, was to leave them on the shelves where nature intended them to be. The muffled voices seemed to be getting closer. Gold, gold, gold now you're singing the chorus. On the other hand, there were proper ways of entering a library. He waddled over to the shelves and selected Hump Tulip's seminal work How to Kill Insects. All 2,000 pages of it. Vims felt quite light-hearted as he walked up Schoon Avenue. He was aware that there was an inner Vim screaming his head off. He ignored him. You couldn't be a real copper in Ankh Morpork and stay sane. You had to care. And caring in Ankh Morpork was like opening a tin of meat in the middle of a piranha school. Everyone dealt with it in their own way. Colin never thought about it, and Nobby didn't worry about it, and the new ones hadn't been in long enough to be worn down by it, and Carrot was just himself. Hundreds of people died in the city every day, often of suicide. So what did a few more matter? The Vims inside hammered on the walls. There were quite a few coaches outside the Ramkin mansion, and the place seemed to be infested with assorted female relatives and interchangeable emmas. They were baking things and polishing things. Vim strolled through, more or less unregarded. He found Sybil out in the dragon house, in her rubber boots and protective dragon armor. She was mucking out, apparently blissfully unaware of the controlled uproar in the mansion. She looked up as the door shut behind Vim's. Oh, there you are. You're home early, she said. I couldn't stand the fuss, so I came out here. But I'll have to go and change soon she stopped when she saw his expression. There's something wrong, isn't there? I'm not going back, said Vim's. Really? Last week you said you'd do a full watch. You said you were looking forward to it. Not much gets past old Sybil, Vim's thought. She patted his hand. I'm glad you're out of it, she said. Corporal Nobbs darted into the watch house and slammed the door behind him. Well, said Carrot. It's not good, said Nobby. They say the trolls are planning to march to the palace to get Coalface out. There's gangs of dwarfs and trolls wandering around looking for trouble. And beggars. Lettuce was very popular. And there's a lot of guild people out there, too. The city, he said, importantly, is definitely a keg of number one powder. How do you like the idea of camping out on the open plain, said Colin. What's that got to do with it? If anyone puts a match to anything tonight, it's goodbye Ank, said the sergeant morosely. Usually we can shut the city gates, right? But there's hardly more than a few feet of water in the river. You flood the city just to put out fires, said Angua. Yep. Another thing said Nobby. People threw stuff at me. Carrot had been staring at the wall. Now he produced a small, battered black book from his pocket, and started to thumb through the pages. Tell me, he said, in a slightly distant voice, has there been an irretrievable breakdown of law and order? Yet. For about five hundred years, said Colin. 
Irretrievable breakdown of law and order is what Ankh-Morpork is all about. No, I mean more than usual. It's important. Carrot turned a page. His lips moved silently as he read. Throwing stuff at me sounds like a breakdown in law and order, said Nobby. He was aware of their expressions. I don't think we could make that stick, said Colin. It stuck all right, said Nobby, and some of it went down my shirt. Why throw things at you, said Angua. It's cause I was a watchman, said Nobby. The dwarfs don't like the watch cause of Mr. Hammerhawk, and the trolls don't like the watch cause of Coalface being arrested, and people don't like the watch cause of all these angry dwarfs and trolls around. Someone thumped at the door. That's probably an angry mob right now, said Nobby. Carrot opened the door. It's not an angry mob, he announced. Okay. It's an orangutan carrying a stunned dwarf followed by a troll. But he is quite angry, if that's any help. Lady Ramkin's butler, Willie Kins, had filled him a big bath. Ha! Huh. Tomorrow it'd be his butler, and his bath. And this wasn't one of the old hip bath, drag eyed in front of the fire jobs, no. The Ramkin mansion collected water off the roof into a big cistern, after straining out the pigeons, and then it was heated by an ancient geyser asterisk and flowed along drumming, groaning lead pipes to a pair of mighty brass taps and then into an enameled tub. There were things laid out on a fluffy towel beside it. Huge scrubbing brushes, three kinds of soap, a loofah. Asterisk who stoked the boiler. Willie Kins was standing patiently beside the bath, like a barely heated towel rail. Yes, said Vims. His lordship. That is, her ladyship's father. He required to have his back scrubbed, said Willie Kins. You go and help the old geyser stoke the furnace said Vims firmly. Left alone, he struggled out of his breastplate and threw it in the corner. The chainmail shirt followed it, and the helmet, and the money pouch, and various leather and cotton oddments that came between a watchman and the world. And then he sank, gingerly at first, into the suds. Try soap. Soap work, said Detritus. Hold still, will you? said Carrot. You're twisting my head off. Go on, soap him head. Soap your own head. There was a thung noise and Cuddy's helmet came free. Cuddy emerged, blinking, into the light. He focused on the librarian, and growled. He hit me on the head. Oog. He says you came up through the floor, said Carrot. That's no reason to hit me on the head. Some of the things that come up through the floor at Unseen University don't even have a head, said Carrot. Oog. Or they have hundreds. Why were you digging down there? We weren't digging down. We were digging up. Carrot sat and listened. He interrupted only twice. Shot at you. Five time, said Detritus happily. Have to report damage to breastplate but not to backplate on account of fortunately my body got in way, saving valuable city property worth three dollars. Carrot listened some more. Sewers, he said, eventually. It's like the whole city, underground. We saw crowns and stuff carved on the walls. Carrot's eyes sparkled. That means they must date right back to the days when we had kings. And then when we kept on rebuilding the city we forgot they were down there. Um. That's not all that's down there, said Cuddy. We. Found something. Oh. Something bad. You won't like it at all, said Detritus. Bad, bad, bad. Even worse. We thought it would be best to leave it there, said Cuddy, on account of it being evidence. But you ought to see it. It's going to upset everything, said the troll, 
warming to the part. What was it? If we tell you, you say, stupid ethnic people, you pulling my leg off, said Detritus. So you'd better come and see, said Cuddy. Sergeant Colin looked at the rest of the watch. All of us, he said, nervously. E.R. Shouldn't a couple of senior officers stay up here? In case anything happens. Do you mean in case anything happens up here, said Angua, tartly. Or in case anything happens down there. I'll go with Lance Constable Cuddy and Lance Constable Detritus, said Carrot. I don't think anyone else ought to come. But it could be dangerous, said Angua. If I find who's been shooting at Watchmen, said Carrot, it will be. Samuel Vims reached up with a big toe and turned on the hot tap. There was a respectful knock at the door, and Willie Kin's old retainer D in. Would Sir be wanting anything? Vims thought about it. Lady Ramkin said you wouldn't be wanting any alcohol, said Willie Kins, as if reading his thoughts. Did she? Emphatically, sir. But I have here a very fine cigar. He winced as Vims bit the end off and spat it over the side of the bath, but produced some matches and lit it for him. Thank you, Willie Kins. What's your first name? First name, sir. I mean, what do people call you when they've got to know you better? Willie Kins, sir. Oh. Right, then. Well. You may go, Willie Kins. Yes, sir. Vims lay back in the warm water. The inner voice was still in there somewhere, but he tried not to pay any attention. About now, it was saying, you'd be proceeding along the street of small gods, just by the bit of old city wall where you could stop and smoke a roll-up out of the wind. To drown it out, he started to sing at the top of his voice. The cavernous sewers under the city echoed with human and near-human voices for the first time in millennia. Hi ho hi ho uku 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 okay you all stupid. I can't help it. It's my nearly dwarfish blood. We just like singing underground. It comes naturally to us. All right, but why him singing? Him ape. He's a people person. They'd brought torches. Shadows jumped among the pillars in the big cavern, and fled along the tunnels. Whatever the possible lurking dangers, Carrot was beside himself with the joy of discovery. It's amazing. The Via Cloaca is mentioned in some old book I read, but everyone thought it was a lost street. Superb workmanship. Lucky for you the river was so low. It looks as though these are normally full of water. That's what I said, said Cuddy. Full of water, I said. He glanced cautiously at the dancing shadows, which made weird and worrying shapes on the far wall. Strange biped animals, eldritch underground things. Carrot sighed. Stop making shadow pictures, detritus. Oog. What him say? He said do deformed rabbit, it's my favorite, Carrot translated. Rats rustled in the darkness. Cuddy peered around. He kept imagining figures, back there, sighting along some kind of pipe. There were a disturbing few moments when he lost sight of the tracks on the wet stone, but he picked them up again near a mold-hung wall. And then, there was the particular pipe. He'd made a scratch on the stones. It's not far along, he said, handing Carrot the torch. Carrot disappeared. They heard his footsteps in the mud, and then a whistle of surprise, and then silence for a while. Carrot reappeared. My word, he said. You two know who this is. It looks like Cuddy began. It looks like trouble, said Carrot. You see why we didn't bring it back up, said Cuddy. Carrying a human's corpse through the streets right now would not be a good idea, I thought. Especially this one. 
I thought some of that, too, Detritus volunteered. Right enough, said Carrot. Well done, men. I think we'd better. Leave it for now, and come back with a sack later on. And. Don't tell anyone else. Except the sergeant and everyone, said Cuddy. No. Not even them. If D make everyone very. Jumpy. Just as you say, Corporal Carrot. We're dealing with a sick mind here, men. Underground light dawned on Cuddy. Ah, he said. You suspect Corporal Nobbs, sir. This is worse. Come on, let's get back up. He looked back towards the big pillar barred cavern. Any idea where we are, Cuddy? Could be under the palace, sir. That's what I reckoned. Of course, the tunnels go everywhere. Carrot's worried train of thought faltered away on some distant track. There was water in the sewers, even in this drought. Springs flowed into them, or water filtered down from far above. Everywhere was the drip and splash of water. And cool, cool air. It would almost be pleasant were it not for the sad, hunched corpse of someone that looked for all the world like Bino the Clown. Vims dried himself off. Willie Kins had also laid out a dressing gown with brocade on the sleeves. He put it on, and wandered into his dressing room. That was another new thing. The rich even had rooms for dressing in, and clothes to wear while you went into the dressing rooms to get dressed. Fresh clothes had been laid out for him. Tonight there was something dashing in red and yellow. About now he'd be patrolling Treacle Mine Road. And a hat. It had a feather in it. Vims dressed himself, and even wore the hat. And he seemed quite normal and composed, until you realized that he avoided meeting his own gaze in the mirror. The watch sat around the big table in the guardroom and in deep gloom. They were off duty. They'd never really been off duty before. What say we have a game of cards, said Nobby, brightly. He produced a greasy pack from somewhere in the noisome recesses of his uniform. You won everyone's wages off them yesterday, said Sergeant Colin. Now's the chance to win em back, then. Yeah, but there were five kings in your hand, Nobby. Nobby shuffled the cards. S funny, that, he said, there's kings everywhere, when you look. There certainly is if you look up your sleeve. No, I mean, there's kings way in ank, and kings in cards, and we get the king's shilling when we join up, said Nobby. We got kings all over the place except on that gold throne in the palace. I'll tell you. There wouldn't be all this trouble around the place if we had a king. Carrot was staring at the ceiling, his eyebrows locked in concentration. Detritus was counting on his fingers. Oh, yes, said Sergeant Colin. Beer D be a penny a pint, the trees D bloom again. Oh, yeah. Every time someone stubs a toe in this town, turns out it wouldn't have happened if there'd been a king. Vim's D go spare to hear you talk like that. People D listen to a king, though, said Nobby. Vim's D say that's the trouble said Colin. It's like that thing of his about using magic. That stuff makes him angry. How you get king in a first place, said Detritus. Someone sawed up a stone, said Colin. Ha! Huh. Anti-siliconism. Nat, someone pulled a sword out of a stone, said Nobby. How'd he know it was in there, then? Colin demanded. It. It was sticking out, wasn't it? Where anyone could have grabbed it. In this town. Only the rightful king could do it, see, said Nobby. Oh, right, said Colin. I understand. Oh, yes. So what you're saying is, 
someone d decided who the rightful king was before he pulled it out. Sounds like a fix to me. Probably someone had a fake hollow stone and some dwarf inside hanging on the other end with a pair of pliers until the right guy came along a fly bounced on the window pane for a while, then zigzagged across the room and settled on a beam, where Cuddy's idly thrown axe cut it in half. You got no soul, Fred, said Nobby. I would not have minded being a knight in shining armor. That's what a king does if you are useful. Audiobook generated by, read with the ears.